All right, this is going to be a fun video. If you spend time in bear country, you need to be prepared and know what you're doing. But is the internet helping you or sabotaging you? We're going to find out today. This is a bear's toolkit, and this is the human toolkit. Today, we're going to discuss how and when to use each item for self defense in the backcountry and identify which drills will best prepare you for a bear charge. I've again partnered with Todd Orr, who famously survived a double grizzly attack. Todd has previously helped me debunk some of the internet's nonsense regarding his experience, but today, Todd is going to help me rate the internet's bear charge drills and analogs on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 meaning almost completely irrelevant, and 10 meaning a near perfect representation of a charging bear. We'll use three criteria. First, how well does the drill approximate the speed of a bear? Second, how well does the analog approximate the movement of a bear's vitals? And third, how well does the analog approximate the environment, terrain, and circumstances where a charge may occur? To get started, I want to know, what do you consider your most important defensive tool when in the backcountry? Make sure to share your thoughts in the comments below and stay tuned because we're going to discuss. Now, if I were heading into bear country, this would not be my first choice for self-defense and I'll give you 11 reasons why. This grizzly claw is approximately the same size as this blade and a grizzly has 10 of these on its front paws and they're attached to an animal that can weigh more than 1,000 pounds. More than that, these are a bear's secondary weapons. This is a bear's primary weapon. While you're probably looking at these massive canines, I want you to look at this first. These gaps between the cranium and the zygomatic arches or cheekbones house massive muscles that have only one purpose, powering these bone crushing jaws. By some estimates, grizzlies have a bite force of more than 1,000 pounds per inch. This is essentially an industrial press. Now, there are a handful of sensational accounts where someone used a knife to fight off a grizzly, but those are typically sub-adult bears, and the individuals involved often suffered terrible injuries even when they survived. As far as bear defense is concerned, there are better options. This knife in particular was in fact handcrafted by Todd Orr. Not only does Todd still live, work, and play in grizzly country, but he's also an exceptional craftsman. Todd makes stunning, unique knives that have the added benefit of reminding you to be prepared when you head into bear country. So if you're in the market for an exceptional knife, then make sure to head over to skybladeknives.com and check out Todd's work. With that, let's get into the meat of today's video. This is something that I've been thinking about for a long time, because all of us who spend time in bear country, we all kind of have the same problem. We, we don't have a bear to practice with, a real live bear to practice with, right? So we're forced to come up with drills that kind of approximate the experience. Um, I've seen, I don't know how many bears in the wild, I've seen them running at full speed, but I have never been charged or attacked by one. And that's why Todd offers a truly unique and valid perspective here. We're gonna go through nine examples and then we'll kind of share what we like, what we don't like. We're not trying to be unduly critical, um, but because we are talking about human safety and we got to get kind of serious here, we are going to be bluntly honest. If there is something that is problematic, we're going to bring it up. But like I said, we're also going to try and give people credit where credit is due. And with that, Todd, you ready to jump into these? I'm ready. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Well, let's watch analog number one, which I think comes from Alaskan ballistics. Okay. So I'm watching these guys. The guy's, it's, it's very slow. The guy is pulling the, the target towards him by running in the snow, which yeah. is probably at 10 miles an hour at best. It looks like the guy has his hand in his pockets. So his hands are warm and I'm not sure, but I think that he's got the gun in his hand as well. And yeah. so he just has to pull his hand out of his pocket with the gun in his hand and shoot. So that's really not reality. Usually you've got it in a holster the guy he's facing the the target he's prepared he's ready it's you know he, yeah. he's ready for the situation 
Yeah, it's almost purposefully baked for the best possible outcome here. And really, when you're training, you need to prep for the worst possible scenario, not the best possible scenario. Absolutely. Right? Um, so I agree with you. I think that, I think the speed is problematic. A human being running in the snow is never going to approximate a running, a, a full charge bear. It, there's, there's really just no. no relevance there. Um, I will say though, that there is one thing that is kind of going on here because they're, at least in my eye, because they're pulling their sled over uneven snow. I am seeing that bear target kind of jostle around pretty quickly. It is, yeah, it is moving back and forth and, and also in the wind. And so it, it's not just a straight line shot. Yeah. So we got to give them a little bit of credit there. I think they deserve some credit for that. That irregularity, I think, I think is relevant, but I don't think it overcomes some of the problems with this. Be very cautious looking at this as an example of how to charge. So I don't know about you, Todd, but what kind of a rating would you give for this one? I, I have to give it like a two or a three. It, yeah. it best probably it's pretty pretty slow slow is the worst part of it <laughs> how yeah. slow it is it's slow they're they're really well prepared hand in the yeah. pockets on the gun I, there's a lot of things that could be improved here i agree let's move on to the next one okay so this one comes from a channel called um guns gear and outdoor alaska so the snow machine okay so he's got a snowmobile pulling the target so he's got a little bit more speed there yeah now it starts kind of slow but it does pick up speed it's probably maybe up to 15 miles an hour maybe at the top speed now the guy again is he it goes by him not directly at him and he is prepared for it he's ready he knows what's coming mm -hmm. and it's fairly straight line just shoots right by him yeah so it not the best speed but better than the last one yeah I agree with you. I think it's I think it's a definite improvement over the last one with the speed. It also has a little bit of that jostling motion in the snow, just like the mm -hmm. previous sled did. Um, and I think uh, specifically because this is, a, this is a rifle drill, I think there's something worth saying here because rifles are not really meant for quick deployment, right? Correct. Un unless you have your rifle ready in a fire ready position, it's very, very difficult. I've run some drills. I have not been successful at quick deployment with rifles. Um, so the fact that he is already in a ready to fire position, I think is actually relevant for this particular drill for a rifle. That's where you should be. Sure. Um, but one thing that I think also, I mean, he doesn't have any gear on, he's just holding the rifle. Um, if you're carrying full pack and then also trying to deploy your deterrent, that's a much different scenario than just standing out in the snow with a shirt and and absolutely yeah yeah you hit the clothing that you're wearing the backpack the gear the bino harness everything changes how quick you can react in any situation yeah exactly so i think that this is a definite improvement um so what what what, what are you thinking for a reason well, on this one we'll give it uh one more than the last we'll say maybe a four out of it three to four. four there's some stuff to learn from this one those some caution lights that should be lit as well i agree okay um, let's go ahead and uh, let's watch the next one. Begin walking okay. lateral to our targets, which are charging us, but on edge. And so this one comes one from uh, Vortex Nation. So these guys um, are, I assume, affiliated with Vortex Optics, and uh, they're doing an indoor drill. Okay. I like the idea that he has his backpack on. He's got a rifle over his shoulder. He's carrying the gear he would normally carry That's in nice the woods. I have to give it a, a really low rating for the speed. It is like yeah. at a like at a snail's pace crawl here coming towards him. They're obviously prepared for it. They're looking right in the direction, just trying to guess which target is going to flip to them. So mm -hmm. it's not at all reality in that sense and the mm -hmm. speed and it's just everything is set up indoors. It's not in a situation you would ever be in, but the fact that he's got some gear on, that's good. Uh, yeah. That's about the only positive thing out of this one. The speed is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very much in agreement with you. I watched this one and I do want to give them credit because when you do put on all your gear, you really, that's how you need to be training because that is how you're going to be encountering an animal. Um, but for me, everything else is just extremely problematic. Um, I've been looking up at some of these target retriever, like Dolly systems, and there was one company claimed that they had the fastest one on the market and they were, they were bragging at it at about nine and a half miles per hour. 
And so compare that with 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> we're not even in the same universe. And then there's another problem with the regularity of these target retrieval systems, right? Mm -hmm. They are on this, this straight track. Yep. There's, there's no like irregularity. There's no bouncing. No variation, around. no. And you know exactly where it's heading, right? You got this giant line that's pointing from the start point to the end point. And that's that's just not how a bear charge is going to work, right? No, I mean, the only, only kudos I can give them is for having their gear on, and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I also, that's going to come into some of these other ones, is they're on this, and this is a specifically a problem with indoor firing ranges, they're on this perfectly flat cement surface, mm -hmm. right? And I, no, you're never going to get charged by a bear, well, maybe, maybe someone is going to get charged in the, at the zoo, in the zoo, maybe at, at the zoo, <laughs> or maybe on a roadway. I don't know, but this flat surface in the drills that I've run, it can set you up. It, it can give you such a false sense of security. I was running some drills at about 35, 40 feet. And I was landing like five or six shots in a five inch square or five inch circle in about four seconds. And I started to think, oh, that's pretty good because they're all going kind of in the sweet spot, the Goldilocks zone. But mm -hmm. then when I moved to uneven terrain and I tried doing it on a slope, my shots were, I was nowhere near as accurate, right? Sure. So yeah. that that flat surface, that's going to be a big problem for a, for a lot of these coming up, but it is something that I want to bring up. So anyways, absolutely. Um, what kind of a rating would you give these guys? I think their heart's in the right place, but I think there's a lot of problems with this one. Yeah, I, I have to rate it down pretty low at, you know, like a one to two. You know, yeah. there's really nothing I can give them except the fact that they're trying something and they're wearing their gear at least. Yeah. <laughs> they're awesome. not in their shorts and flip-flops, so that's good. <laughs> Excellent. No, I, I agree with you. So, all right, let's move on to the next one. See if we can uh, find some better analogs here. So this one comes from Outdoor Life, um, a pretty prominent hunting publication. Now, I do want to preface this one. The video dealt primarily with whether or not a semi-auto or a revolver is a better defensive firearm for a bear charge. However, this specific exercise has been highlighted on OutdoorLife.com specifically as a bear charge drill. I like the, the idea that they're doing a speed and accuracy shooting here, which is always good. Good training, you know, trying to get on your target quickly, be accurate with it. But the target is not moving towards them at all. They are having to shift their, their line of fire left and right because of the different targets and different closeness and distance. But it's not actually moving towards them. It's set up on a range and a flat. Everything is not really reality of as of a bear charge, but it's good practice for, like I said, speed and accuracy. So I have yeah. to give them, you know, give credit for that. If you know anything you want to do out there, you need to practice it, yeah. whether it's practicing deploying your bear spray or your, your handgun, it's also accuracy as well. Yeah, no. And I agree with you where I see value in this one is your ability to kind of work on those fundamentals of handling, handling your defensive tool and then shifting to different locations. So I do think that that's very valuable. I, I actually tried this one. I didn't use metal targets. I used uh, water jugs and I actually had a lot of success with this, but then I tried it with a moving target and something about this actually began to really concern me. And it's kind of what we talked about with the, with the dolly systems and the tracks, right? Where if you know where the starting point is and you know where the ending point is, it is so easy to anticipate your next shot, sure. right? And this one, they they stagger it a little bit, so you got to work a little bit hard. But the the fact remains is that you go from target one to target two, and you know where target two is, and it's always going to be there. Target three is not going to move. Target four is not going to move. I was really concerned because they they set this up as an actual bear charge simulation, as if he's zigzagging towards you. But, yeah. but it would be a speed, but it's not reality of zigzagging. It's just the target that you're yeah. picking. So. <laughs> and, and more than that, it, it doesn't have the irregular motion of like bobbing bear vitals. Right. And I, I just, began, I got worried that people were going to look at this and say, oh, if I can do this, I'm ready for a bear charge. And I, I would say this is a good place to start, but I would not leave it here is kind of my Absolutely. perspective. I agree. So, 
So what kind of a rating do you guys think these guys deserve? Well, I, I think that, like you said, the fundamentals are great. It's something you should practice your speed and accuracy. So I'd like to rate them higher for that. But as far as towards a, a charge of a bear, it's down really low. So I'm going to have to still give it that two to three range, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I agree with you. I mean, there's some value here, but this right. is just that introductory level. Please yep. don't let it end at this is what I would say. You need to reach a much higher level of proficiency and find, and find better drills. So, all right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, this comes from Eastman's hunting journals. Your other arm is disabled and you can't shoot it two handed. How hey, he's got a rolling tire off the side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I like the idea that his back was turned. So he wasn't seeing where it was coming from. So that's good. It's kind of a little bit more of a surprise. Yeah. I like the idea of a, the tire coming towards him. If there was some, a little bit rougher terrain, I think it would have bounced more, which mm -hmm. would have given more of like a bear running or jumping over something as it's coming through you a little more of that, you know, different in the terrain, but it was fairly straight. And then it veered off to his side and it was mm -hmm. probably 10 yards away and he was shooting at it, at it as it went by. Yeah. It's like, why would you shoot at a bear as it's going by you if it decided yeah. not to attack you? <laughs> yeah. You if know, it's, if you, if it's, it's on its way out, it let it go. You know, if it, mm. if you shoot it, then it might decide, okay, now I'm going to turn and attack you because it's wounded and it feels an injury and now it's going to defend itself. Yeah. So I didn't like that idea that he was still shooting as it was going by him. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's an important point. Um, yeah. I mean, bears, especially if we're talking about grizzlies, bluff charges, false charges, they actually happen about four times out of five once a bear charges. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty common occurrence. I like that he kind of waited until the tire, you know, there are no measurements, so I don't know for sure, but it seems like it's probably in the ballpark of about 30 feet, which is where you really need to start. Like this is, that's when the bear is a threat to you and sure. you need to do something about it. If it had a little bit more, you know, bounce to it and a little bit more irregularity, I think there would be some value with this. He's mm -hmm. also got his gear on. So I like yep, that. Correct. And I like that his back was turned because for people who are aware with, of your experience, that's how it happened it both comes, times. It comes you, from right? behind. Came from behind. I think it's important to stress if a bear is veering off, if it's not coming directly at you, it's probably a bluff charge trying to intimidate. And this is a hard thing about spending time in bear country, learning to understand a bear's behavior so that you don't mm -hmm. use your defensive tool prematurely or unnecessarily absolutely i would have liked to seen these guys do a few more of these tire rolls until they got one coming right at him mm -hmm. with some bouncing and then see how well he did that would mm -hmm. have been a lot better i think yeah exactly so. one thing that i did see that was a concern for me for this one is the size of the target right mm -hmm. so when you're using a firearm it's not just a matter of hitting the bear right that's not that difficult to do What's really important if you're using a firearm is landing those shots where they really count. Absolutely. And so using such a large target, I think can give you a false sense of security. So if you're, if you're reviewing it afterwards, like, oh, I got to hit there, hit there, hit there. Target is too, the target's too large. Yeah. And the speed was not that fast either. Yeah. And the speed was a little on the slow side, probably about 15 Yep. 17 miles an hour, something like that. So better than sure. some of our early ones, but still we're only halfway to bear speed. Yep. So anyways, what, what are you thinking for this one? Well, I like the potential of it could have been a little bit better. Um, I like the idea that they could have maybe got some more bouncing out of it would have helped. Um, so I'm going to give it, I'm going to say maybe a five. A five. I think as long as you kind of understand some of the the issues with it, this could be a relevant training exercise. Yeah, I think they just could have done a little bit better. I think we're we're kind of approaching some some possibilities here. This one comes from Meat Eater, popular um, platform for hunting. Yeah, I like the fact that his back was turned, and he's got a buddy that yells "bear, bear, bear," and so that's when he turns towards the target. And it was coming faster than than you know than some of the others, not at full speed like a bear would be, but a little bit faster. But if you noticed, he he fumbled just trying to get to the bear spray there. 
Mm -hmm. the, and so he ended up shooting from the hip. I don't know if he was planning to shoot from the hip, but either way, he kind of fumbled, which is kind of reality of what can happen out there when you got something coming at you. I mean, he knew this was happening and he still fumbled. So yeah. if you had a real bear attack, you it kind of shows that things can go bad. You may lose a couple seconds and that could be the end of it. I think this is actually kind of a, a system that's used by Montana Fish Wildlife and parks. And parks, yes. And uh, I don't know what to call it, like a bear cart or whatever. I think it approaches speeds of about 20, 25 miles per hour. So I think it's in also inching us closer to that real world speed mm -hmm. of a bear. Also looking at this, I think that is, I mean, while it's maybe a little sloppy, and I think you can expect that if you're facing down a bear, right? And you're scared for your life. Mm -hmm. Um, it, he still got it off and he still he landed a shot on the bear's face. And I think that is much easier to do with bear spray than it is with, a you've fire. got a lot wider, wider area that your, your spray is, you know, spreading out. And I think that makes a difference in a close situation like that. Yeah. So while I've been kind of critical of some of these analogs is not having like the irregular Bob and kind of weave of those organs, when it comes to bear spray, that's not as big of a concern because you have this broad cone of sustained spray. Mm -hmm. um, you do need to be aware of it, but it's much easier to hit a small or a large moving target at, you know, with bear spray compared to a firearm. So it's just something people need to be aware of. If you're practicing with a firearm, the criteria are going to be a little bit different than if you're practicing with bear spray. Absolutely. So, all right. So what would you give the, this one? A little bit faster speed and his back was turned i think he did a pretty good job but i think i'll give him like that a strong six maybe a seven excellent yeah i think there's some some good stuff going on here it is still on that level ground but again with bear mm -hmm. spray i'm not as concerned about that as i would be with a firearm so okay let's uh move on to the next one this is also going to be from meat eater um youtube channel podcast um but this is a firearm drill okay so they're they're getting that irregularity in the in the ball that's bouncing back. So it's coming, it's bouncing off the ground. It's bouncing at different angles. He doesn't know for sure what direction it's going to go. So he's got to think on the fly. He's got to be quicker at responding. It's still a little bit slow on some of them. I think they could have, uh, you know, done a few more examples, maybe throwing the ball harder at the at the woods so it bounced back faster at him. But I do like that it's it's changing it up and it's not a straight on target coming directly at you. Mm -hmm. And it's a smaller target as well. So you've got to be more accurate in this situation for sure. Yeah. And I agree with you. I there was um, as I looked at this example, I felt like they were on to something with this mm -hmm. one. I actually went out and I, I tried this with a few improvements and I, I'm going to share it later in the video. Okay. A couple of things from these guys. Um, first of all, his pack, he's wearing his pack, but there's nothing in it. Right. Right. So <laughs> that I, changes I guess, everything is a, you know, everything like that is going to change the situation and your outcome. So yeah, you want to practice as close to possible of what you would actually be wearing in the field if you really want to get the right practice. So that was something I wanted to bring up. I mean, I think his heart's in the right place, putting the pack on but you need your weight in there. You need to know how it's going to change your center of balance, how that recoil is mm -hmm. going to feel with that extra weight. Um, another thing that I saw is that he kind of started with his hand on the gun, kind of similar to the first guys where the guy had his hand yeah. in the pocket, probably on the gun. He was and, prepared. He's ready yeah. to go. You know, yeah. it's not a surprise and, attack. <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, Todd, the bears always broadcast to you that. they. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no. So that that's pretty unreasonable. Um, if you're going to train something like this, keep your hands away from your deterrent. You need to, you, again, you train for the worst case scenario, not the best case scenario, mm -hmm. but Again, we're kind of level surface, but I think the irregularity of the bouncing ball can kind of help a little bit with, with that. But I still think that you're better off on an irregular surface if you're going to really want to be proficient with a firearm um, as bear defense. I don't think they quite got there, but what kind of a rating would you give these guys? I'd have to give it around that uh, six to seven again, I believe. I agree. I think, I think there's it's a some, good idea. It's a good idea there. I think some more practice on and making that a little bit faster would, would help. Yeah. A few improvements I think could make this something very, very relevant. Well, let's move on to, I think it might be the last one or we're getting close to the end. Oh, we got two more. So this one um, comes from gun 
Fighters Inc. So they're they make holsters, and they are practicing with a kind of a a railed cart system. Okay. Yeah, I like I like the speed. It's uh, seems to be a little bit quicker than the others. Mm -hmm. He. He it is a straight line directly at him. There's no change in the the movement of the the target, so not really reality there. But it is faster. Uh, he doesn't have any other gear on, you know. To maybe I don't. It's hard to say what he might have been doing otherwise. But he's he's in a gravel pit on a flat ground in the middle of the sunlight of the day, and target's coming fast. I got to give it some credit for that. Yeah, I think the speed is where this one kind of where the the main virtue of this drill is. Is just the speed of the target. Mm -hmm. um, but like you say, I mean, the, the track is always going to be a problem. If you yeah. know at the beginning where the target starts, where the target ends, I worry you're, you're going to set yourself up for failure because that's just not how it's going to work in real life. If you've ever seen a bear run, um, it's dynamic. I mean, you have these powerful animals that are charging over uneven terrain. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't come at you in a straight line. As far as not having gear, I think that's also a problem. I, but you know, before I harp on it too much, I also want to say that sometimes when you're out in the back country, you do take your pack off, right? Sure. Um, you go and you filter water or you're taking a break in the shade or, you know, there, there are reasons to take your pack off. So yeah, yeah, I guess you should practice without the pack, but again, it's this idea you, you, you prep for the worst so that you're the most Absolutely. prepared you can be. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. What kind of a rating do you think uh, gunfighters Inc gets for their, their drill? Yeah, so for that last one, I think about I'm gonna give him a seven. Yeah, I think um, you know it. The speed was better, definitely the speed better. But we, you know, they they had some things they were missing there for sure. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's move on to our final example. Now this is uh, comes from UDAP. They're actually a, a manufacturer of bear spray. I think they, they manufactured mm -hmm. the bear spray you used in your experience. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. I still okay. use it today. Okay. Awesome. Um, how do you rank their, how do you rate their system? I like the speed. It's definitely a lot faster. Um, I'm, you know, it must be 20 miles an hour, maybe more. I don't know if you've heard the speed that they're using or not, but it looks like it's pretty quick. So I got to give yeah. them a plus there. And it, you've got a longer distance there instead of just coming right on you. You got to, people get a chance to see what it's like if it's charging, you know, through the brush or something, you've got a little bit longer track there. Mm -hmm. So I, what I, it, it goes past you and it's on a straight line track again on a flat mm -hmm. ground in a parking lot kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of a negative side. It's not reality, but I think they're at least got the speed up and mm -hmm. people, you know, people can come there off the street if they want, I think, and, and, and test that and like get an idea what it feels like to have something coming at you a lot faster and, and people can fail or succeed at it. I yeah. think it's good in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think they actually approach close to 30 miles per hour on this. One. Is it 30? Okay. I, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think it's over 20, okay. approximately 30. I think it's better because of the speed, but mm -hmm. you know, none of, none of them that we've looked at have been to the speed of a real charging bear. Okay. It is amazing at 35 or 40 miles an hour. Yeah. And the one thing about a bear is when they launch and take off, they hit their full speed within about one or two strides. Yeah. That's one unique thing about a bear. They are instantly at full speed and not building up speed. So it's yeah. coming at you that quick right away. And you know, the thing with an actual charge is it, it, the brush is flying, it's low to the ground, the ears are laid back, it might be growling or at you. And it's a completely different situation than watching something come at you on a, in a yeah. parking lot kind of, yeah. kind of thing, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I do so like that's... the speed. It's definitely, it's definitely better. It's better than all the others for sure. Yeah. And so I think I'd have to rate them a little bit higher because of that and give them maybe an eight. Yeah. Okay. Again, it's just much easier to hit a target with that cone of spray absolutely than, than it is to land those those bullets where they will matter most right mm -hmm. some people aren't going to like that i say that but i think the metrics that you use to judge a firearm drill versus a bear spray drill are just a little different right absolutely i think kind of at least my takeaway from what we've kind of learned from all of these um is that there is no one for one I mean, I think there's some value in all of these things. If if people are trying, Absolutely. 
if they're out there, if they're investing their time and their energies and trying to become proficient with their tools, I think there's real value there. Um, for some of these drills, I think you need to be very careful because they can give you a, a very real false sense of security. Just because in some cases they are so far removed from the right. reality. The key to all of it is practice as well. And practicing in a, in a real life situation, if you can, it would be great if you could practice on the side of a mountain in, in dense timber where you can like, you know, you've got trees and things and then practice pulling your bear spray, your gun or having a target or on a steep hillside where a bear might be coming downhill or uphill at you. All of, all of those things are going to change the outcome and change how, you know, the, if you succeed at this or not temperature conditions, you know, everybody's at 80 degrees in a parking lot. That's a lot different than 10 degrees in a snowstorm when a bear comes out of the dark brush at you. So yeah, and, and there's a lot of things. Stiff. Yeah. Yeah. Your hands are stiff. You know, I have to, I have cold hands all the time. I have to wear gloves out there, you know, mm -hmm. trying to get your finger through the trigger guard or getting your glove off in time, all those things are going to slow you down. So yeah. anybody it's like, oh, I could, I could hit that bear with eight shots before he got on me. Well, it all depends on the situation. It's not like you're standing yeah. in the, the, at the range shooting at something versus being in the field. So I think those things have to be considered. Yeah, no. And I agree. When I've done drills with people, um, I bring up the fact that with firearm users specifically, the best data that we have suggests that there's a 50% injury rate. We, in fact, I think it was last month, had a hunter up in British Columbia who mortally wounded a grizzly, um, but he still suffered significant injuries. It's something people need to be aware of. The level of proficiency with a firearm is just much, much higher than bear spray. And it's not that they don't have their place. Um, the hunter mm -hmm. successfully defended himself, right? Sure. Um, but when you look at these analogs, you need to understand that they're pretty far removed from the real thing. And just because you succeed at the analog doesn't necessarily mean you're ready to go out and depend yeah. exclusively on a firearm to keep it Absolutely. safe. Absolutely. When you're out in the woods and some, you hear something behind you and it surprises you and you turn and there's a 500 pound grizzly bear coming at you through the brush, that's a lot different feeling. Your adrenaline's going to be changing a lot more than if you're standing in a parking lot knowing something's coming at you. And yeah. I think that's where a lot of people are going to fail if they're not both, you know, if they're not prepared and not practiced and not even mentally prepared. You know, I when I'm out in the woods all the time, I'm I'm just randomly I'll think about bear and I'll just pull my bear spray or pull my handgun and, and be like, all right, and just, just keep doing it over and over and over. So hopefully if it happens again, I'm prepared, I'm ready, I'm not gonna like fumble. Yeah. But you never know. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, you're taking a chance every time you're out there and you got to be prepared for it for sure. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And so I, I generally tell people that they should start with bear spray um, because it's much easier to master mm -hmm. um, much easier to land those shots. Very easy to deploy. Relatively speaking, it's still something that you need to practice. Absolutely. Right? You're not just going to buy it, go out and it's just going to magically keep you safe. You need to be proficient with that tool. Um, however, there is a time and a place for a firearm. If you wish to take a firearm with you, um, I encourage people to get as much experience as they can mm -hmm. prioritize proficiency and safety, because that's another thing that we got to talk about. If you are not sufficiently responsible and proficient with a firearm, you're not just a liability to yourself. You then also become a liability to other people. So there is absolutely a high standard of personal responsibility. You're responsible for your own safety and you're responsible for what happens when you use that firearm. I took the at least bouncing ball drill because I felt like that one had the most potential. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it was quite there because I think the balls were too large. I think they were moving too slow. So I went out and I experimented. I started with 10 inch kickballs and had some what I would call deceptive success. Still, with one exception, when I fumbled removing the safety clip, I hit the ball every time I used my inert practice. Spin. Now, I also managed a few successful runs with both my 10 millimeter pistol and my rifle, but more often than not, I missed. Now, that's not to say that my shots would not have been successful in a face-off with an aggressive bear. For the most part, they were near misses and likely would have had some effect. You don't necessarily need to kill a bear to deter aggression with a firearm. Warning shots can be quite effective, 
But if you need to shoot a bear, the only shots guaranteed to drop a bear and prevent injury are a direct hit to the brain or spinal vertebrae. And those are really tough targets to hit if the bear is at full charge. But more than that, as I've discussed in my Guns vs. Bear Spray video, gun users are roughly 38 times more likely to deter aggression by black bears when compared with grizzlies and polar bears. So if you're traveling in grizzly or polar bear country, you need to be really self-critical and thoroughly refine the drills you use if you want to be prepared for an aggressive grizzly or polar bear encounter. That wasn't a very good draw. With a few exceptions, the individuals running the drills we've discussed today got pulled into what I call the self-congratulatory trap. After running their drills, they began looking at their paper bears and then patting themselves on the back when they landed what seemed to be an effective shot. But remember, none of the drills we address today accurately reflect the real-world circumstances of an actual bear charge. Look for ways to further improve your drills and your performance. This is about your personal safety, not high fives at the shooting range. In the end, I was not satisfied with the kickballs. They were still too big and they were way too slow and very susceptible to bullet splatter which I once mistook for a successful hit. I needed something smaller, tougher, and faster. So I switched to five inch basketballs in order to increase the drill difficulty and better approximate the size of my target, a bear's head. On average, the basketballs were better at maintaining their velocity, but despite the fact that we were throwing these balls at close to 40 miles an hour, the balls still regularly shed two thirds of their velocity and we rarely managed an average simulated charge of more than 15 miles per hour. However, charge speed being the exception, this improved bouncing ball drill consistently met our other criteria. Both my day and overnight packs were at or near trail weight. I practiced on sloped terrain with other real world conditions, including being assaulted by hundreds of mosquitoes, which you may have already noticed in the footage. What was I going to say? That said, I still think there's room for improvement, so make sure to stay tuned for updates. Now, for safety reasons, I did not use my guns when simulating a charge from behind. This was not only for the safety of everyone present while I was running my drills, but because in the backcountry, you should never draw your gun without being 100% certain about the location of your target and what is beyond your target. The last thing anyone needs is someone roaming around the woods like Elmer Fudd, or worse, Yosemite Sam, ready to start blasting the first thing that moves. That'll learn ya. If you have not seen a bear, but have seen bear sign, or are concerned about the possibility of a surprise encounter, I encourage you to group everyone in your party together and actively carry your bear spray in your dominant hand with your thumb ready to remove the safety clip. Please. Do not wander around the backcountry with your gun drawn just in case you encounter a bear. Now I'm going to go over the setup for this drill in a coming video, oh, yeah, including how you can calculate the speed of your ball throws and your simulated charges, you one more in you? as well as some sure. other tricks and refinements. So make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to get access when that video drops. Of the drills we've discussed today, I think this drill showed the most promise. It still has its limitations, so even if you're nailing your shots every nice. time, which I doubt by the way, don't get overconfident. I got him! Great kid! Don't get cocky! If you're attuned to your surroundings and familiar with the bear attack ABCs and have properly layered your defenses, you should have more advanced warnings than the 10 to 20 yards represented by this drill. But your ability to quickly ready and deploy your deterrent should be central to your training. Your most important defensive tool in the backcountry is your brain. None of these items will do you any good if you're not using your head. And that means education, training, and preparation. Now, I seriously doubt that any of you are going to carry a sledgehammer into the backcountry. But earlier this year, a 15-year-old boy was attacked by a black bear while watching TV in a cabin. In that freak scenario, you may have to improvise and a hammer might be an effective tool. The same is true of a hatchet, which some of you may carry in the backcountry or have available in your campsite. So if for whatever reason you lack better options, you may want to reach for a hatchet if dealing with a black bear. Now, as discussed earlier, a knife like a hammer or a hatchet is a tool of desperation. This is particularly true 
if squaring off with a grizzly or polar bear. Even this gorgeous, razor-sharp offering made by Todd puts you far too close to harm to be a reliable defensive option. Now, it is possible in the most generous sense of the word to fight off a bear with a knife, but if you're smart, you'll have better defensive tools available to you. Now, bear spray. Ignore everyone who tells you it's not a valid bear defense option. They are only declaring their ignorance. In trained hands, bear spray is extraordinarily effective, but it's also not a guarantee. Every now and then a trigger has to be pulled. Or not pulled. It's hard to know which in your pajamas. If justified, the right gun in the right hands is the only tool that can end a threat once and for all. But it's also true that gun users are statistically far less successful than bear spray users. But as Tom Smith, one of the authors of those studies, once told me, people are individuals, not statistics. Intelligent, proficient, and responsible shooters are valuable companions in the backcountry. But that is also a very high standard. If you choose to carry a gun in the backcountry, seek out information and training that will help you improve. There are a great many gun advocates that get offended when I share the roughly 50% injury rate suffered by those who rely on guns during a hostile bear encounter. But imagine you were a police officer or on a SWAT team or in the special forces and you were given actionable intelligence on the effectiveness of your tools, but one of your team members ignored it because they didn't like it or it didn't mesh with their personal opinions. Would you want to head into a hostile nice. encounter Feeling with lucky. that person? I wouldn't. Oh. Rejecting actionable intelligence is the opposite of intelligence. It's just stupid. It's not a matter of whether the data is perfect. It's a matter of what you can learn from it to be better prepared. We'll discuss the data that's out there more in the future, so make sure to subscribe and stay tuned. If choosing a firearm for backcountry defense, the benefits of a short gun include carryability, quick deployment, rapid follow-up shots, and close-range versatility. Now, there's also a whole discussion regarding whether a revolver or a semi-auto is, quote, better. And surprise, surprise, the internet has botched that conversation too. So stay tuned and we'll straighten things out in a future video. You should also know that no handgun approaches the muzzle energy advised by wildlife managers should you need to shoot a large brown bear or polar bear. And heavy handguns can be very difficult to master. So, enter long guns. The rifle seen here is calibered in 4570 government. Max loads, which my brother graciously agreed to demonstrate for us. Holy! I was not expecting that. Oh! Approximate the close range muzzle energy of a 300 Magnum rifle. Man, those one of only two hard. firearms specifically listed by Alaska Game and Fish as appropriate if you need to shoot a large bear. Long guns offer more stopping power, but they are also heavy, cumbersome, difficult to deploy rapidly, and not ideal for close quarters defense. However, if I were deep in the Alaska bush, I would keep this rifle close. In case you were wondering, yes. I used full power loads for my 10 millimeter drills and my 4570 drills. Now I advise that you start with standard range ammo. But you need to know how your gun handles the rounds you actually intend to use in the backcountry. Now wow. smaller calibers have proven quite effective at deterring black bears and more timid grizzlies. But if using a handgun to deal with a determined grizzly or polar bear, your shot placement is going to be life or death critical. So make sure you're practicing intelligently. We did have another successful drill. Again, not a direct hit. Grazed the side. We're talking about a very high level of proficiency. And this is not your shooting range activity here. This is not shooting at paper targets or even still targets. This is dynamic shooting, um, intuitive shooting, very different than shooting at a range, much more difficult to master. Even for military drills, this you're shooting at human representations, not a charging animal. So keep that in mind. There we go. Finally. Well, this may look like you're prepping for an Old West-style duel with a bear, 
I cannot stress enough that you want to avoid having to outdraw a bear if at all possible. I think you can speak to this personally because you've been there. It would be better if you didn't have to try and outdraw it if you were prepared in advance. Absolutely. The speed that they can come at you and and the silence up right up to that point, it's just amazing. I mean, and the strength of an animal, it's like everything was a surprise. And I feel like I was very prepared. I practiced everything. I'm in the woods every day in bear country, so I know it can happen. And still, it surprised me. And I, I did the right things. A surprise and I could see how easily I could have fumbled just that one little second difference could have made a big difference ultimately you are responsible for your own safety and the decisions you make but after watching this video you should have a good idea of what drills you can use to become more proficient with your defensive tools just remember practicing with your deterrence is just one aspect of bear safety for a comprehensive guide to safety in bear country, make sure to watch my Bear Attack ABCs video. I have never made a more important bear safety resource. And I really appreciate you coming on helping me out with this. You oh, know, absolutely. And thanks for the invite. Your, your insight is just invaluable. And I'm just glad that we have you and that you're willing to share kind of your experience and your insight with the rest of us. Hopefully it'll prevent someone else from, you know, getting into the situation I was you know, yeah. preparedness and ahead of time and, and be ready for it. Hopefully we've accomplished some of that in this conversation. So that's great. Anyways, thanks, Dodd. And thanks to the rest of you for being part of the discussion. If you think we missed something or if there are better drills out there, let me know and we'll talk about them in a future video. Make sure to go check out Todd's work over on skybladeknives.com. And finally, a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters. You are a critical part of my team. If you haven't joined the community yet, but would like to be part of something truly special, then I hope you'll consider supporting At Home and Wild Spaces on Patreon. Until next time, this is Mike reminding you to be prepared and use your head when in the backcountry.